Willkommen, my friend, to the sad and derelict gallery. Shadows where lurk the wannabes, the never wers, those who mule at the teat of 15 minutes of fast, fleeting fame, the pathetic denizens of the top 10 for the week ending May 12th, 1985. In at number 10, up five places but five years past their prime, is REO Speedwagon. Still basking in the light of an appearance at the Live Aid concert, the band was hopping on to the then emerging power ballad trend here. And that was the last we heard of them. Apart of course from innumerable appearances on those best of the 80s CDs you buy at petrol stations. Number 9 is the truly wretched Love and Pride by King. The first red flag on this should have been the name of the band, or the lack of effort put into naming it. Anyway, it's a rotten record, and on the whole, best forgotten. Number 8 are the perennially popular Pointer Sisters with the Beverly Hills Cop Boosted Neutron Dance. The girls from Oakland chalked up 7 top 40s in Australia, this being the biggest of them, and their spicy, skillful vocals that always recall those classic vocal gymnasts of the 30s and 40s were always a pleasant arrival on the airwaves. Number 7 is a record that will no doubt divide the listener group. Dead or Alive's You Spin Me Round Like a Record. To many, this is a classic party record, Harmless Fluffy Dance Floor Filler. Now, Lord knows I have no issue with Harmless Fluffy Dance Floor Filler. In fact, most of this series spends its time celebrating just such fizzy folder roll. But to me, this and records like Love and Pride don't sound like proper songs. They're just like clattering drones as if an army of Daleks had taken over the local gay club. And so music was increasingly to be for the next 10 years until hip hop and the rise of lo-fi traditionalists took music back and reinvested it with the artist's personality. Number six is the whiny and forgettable Jim Diamond with one of the most trite and featherweight one-week number ones we've had so far. I should have known better. Former singer of PhD, a gee whiz we just got a synthesizer band from the early 80s who had one forgotten hit, Diamond always sounded like the guy who should be singing theme songs to TV shows or the guy no one can hear tucked away in the corner bar of a Friday night with about $7 in change scattered in his guitar case. Like so many records of this era, it's not truly terrible. It's nowhere near good, it just doesn't seem necessary. At last, something interesting at number five, the power station. A supergroup mashup between Chic and Duran Duran, fronted by the consummate professional vocalist in Robert Palmer. Some Like It Hot was one of two hits they had this year, the other being a cover of T-Rex's Get It On, which was pretty good because it all but reinvented the song, yet still held in Palmer's vocal the spirit of the original. Some Like It Hot played hot and heavy with the charts for a few weeks, looking like a genuine contender for number one but by this point it had shot its bolt and was falling very quickly off the charts. Number four brings us to one of the most interesting songs here, Barbados by Models. It's a classic example of the band that labours in obscurity on the lonely furrow of willful ingloriousness to make interesting and challenging music and decides at one point or the other it's time to cash in on their name and actually make some money. I think it's impossible to blame any band for this, it's inherent in the business. And in 1985 it was the turn of models, who for the last half dozen years were purveyors of ticky quirky Euro pop to try and make the brass ring. And they reached it with their 1985 album Out of Mind Out of Sight, which gave us two hit singles, this week's number four Barbados and Out of Mind Out of Sight, which hit number one in September. Barbados is nothing to get too excited about beyond a sing-along chorus and a party vibe and it had, like a lot of songs this week, a short sharp run on the charts which surely earned the band some drinking money which just as surely they drank. Number three deposits in our lap one of the seemingly endless strings of cheesy ballads Phil Collins plopped out like an unsolicited baruch applying his usually little wanted trade to a sudden swarm of bald men. 
One More Night sounds like elevator music and it invites the question why would a man who had some reputation as a drummer resort to the most rinky-dink fire and forget drum machine programming on this record. The culprit seems to be producer Hugh Padgham, an arch castrator of records who seems to bathe everything in numbing sheens of sterile clarity, making everyone from Peter Gabriel to Paul McCartney to split ends sound dull. He even managed to kill David Bowie's comeback with his Faceless Tonight album. And then, thankfully, somebody stopped him. Probably when they realised he made crappy records. To add insult to injuries, Padgham is credited with inventing the gated snare sound that dominated the 1980s. I'm sure he thought it was clever at the time. Anyway, Phil Collins' One More Night is a pestilence that lingered for three and a half months and slogged all the way up to number two. Two is another of those faceless records made by the detritus cast aside by exploding 70s supergroups. This time, Glenn Fry's The Eagles with The Heat Is On. Like most of Fry's work in The Eagles, it's dull. It doesn't do much and sounds like he wrote it in about five minutes. Had it made number one, which it never did, it might well have made the list of the worst records our little series has ever seen at number one. Not that there is such a list, but it's a pretty good idea. I might do that. But I can't speculate on that because it's time for my third favourite segment in this week's presentation, Fowl's Fantastic World of Facts. This week's biggest rider is Wimperzoid Night Shift by the Commodores. While beating a hasty retreat from the charts is struck by Sheena Easton, Sheena of whom there is no recorded evidence of her ever having been a punk rocker, was to find a new lease on chart life in a couple of years through teaming up with her good buddy Prince. She walked in, he woke up, etc. Highest Debutante is an odd song. Everybody Wants to Rule the World by Tears for Fears or more a bang average song by an odd band in Tears for Fears. Odd in so much as they seem to be more popular, more relevant, more significant today than they ever were when their music was new and supposed to be relevant and impactful. Some of this may be the magnifying influence of the internet. I think all of it is the magnifying influence of the internet, which makes everything that happened to us whenever seem bigger and richer for the experience, or seem bigger and richer for you having experienced it. My music I liked is more important my guitar player I liked was a better guitar player than any other. This band is more historically important because they are historically important to me. Or it may be the internet's tendency to inflate and create affiliations. Either a fan of middling 1985 pop band whose memory of the band has become magnified through personalization seeks out and meets similar fans and the magnification snowballs so does the sense of affiliation and self-validation and this is by far more common people affiliating themselves with bands as brands that's a separate phenomenon we can get into later anyway there seems to be a rush on mid-80s bands like tears for fears and depeche mode at the moment due to a first album released since god was a kid and the death of a band member it all has to do with musical generations seeking their icons. And really, if your choices are between Phil Collins and his Casio tone drum machines and Tears for Fears with their tuneful Boss CE2 drenched warbles, well, which one are you going to choose? Now, I've waffled on so long I didn't leave myself enough time to post an appropriate diss to noted rock and roll pro magnon Bruce Springsteen, but his dancing in the dark has been stinking up the charts for 49 weeks by this point, never getting higher than number five. Number one, both in the USA and the UK, were We Are The World by USA For Africa, a record that, depending on who you ask, Prince refused to sing on because A, Bob Geldof called him a creep, or B, Quincy Jones wouldn't let him play a guitar solo on the track, or C, and the number one album around the traps was No Jacket Required, which could have been renamed, of course, No Interesting Songs Required. This is what I call an American psycho record. It's the kind of completely unengaging pabulum that Patrick Bateman would elevate through his desperate desire to fit in to some kind of high art. So, you can wade and neck deep through a river of effluence to find the very gates of musical hell. But when you do, there's always one last monster to slay. That monster is a monkey. 
and his drums are way better than Phil Collins's. So don't make a liar out of me, Monty. Number one this week is the only record worthy to top that mountain of poop that is this week's top 10. USA for Africa and We Are The World, which was until Gal Gadot and her off-key band of Hollywood idiots who sat in their mansion singing Imagine during the height of COVID was the most uptight, self-righteous piece of foolishness that had ever been undertaken by major recording artists. As to whether or not it's a better or worse song than Imagine, I'll leave that for you to debate. One interesting thing about this nine week number one is that it is the first record ever to have been number one simultaneously in the US, the UK and Australia. And there we have it, a week of dull but not dreadful stuff from a year which was generally better. But that's the beauty of our little series, each episode is like a bus. If you don't like this one, there's another one coming along. And I hope that you can ride that metaphorical bus, or perhaps a literal one, my favourite's the 340, next week back to that mysterious and foreign most of countries, the past.